Thanks to all of you, Fishing DMV hit its major milestone on Patreon of 150 Patreon subscribers. This Saturday, August 17th at 6 p.m. at Jake's Bait and Tackle located in Winchester, Virginia, we'll be having our very first meet and greet. Food will be provided free of charge to all Patreon members. We'll also have special merchandise that'll be going out, again, free to all Patreon members. If you're interested, let me know. Again, it'll be August 17th at 6 p.m. See you there. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia, and Shallow Water Fishing Adventures Baits, online, located in Mount Airy, Maryland. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens. Uh, and and this, this individual here has been, I, I've had so many messages, Instagram, email, Twitter, everyone saying, I need to get this guy on and talk about it. The, the Potomac River is really, I think, the linchpin of this whole area. When I said Fishing the DMV, I meant, you know, the surrounding areas of DC, Maryland, and Virginia. But you had to think of one body of water that kind of like exemplified all that the big media hub it's the potomac it is it gets the most traction on a national stage there's the most tournaments there but then if you go down more and more layers to more of a local and regional level you have those team tournament events and and this guy here runs an event that all my friends fish when i used to live you know closer to you you know i used to hop in the boat with some people way way back in the day for just like one or two not a lot of them but I, i did it bob thank you so much for coming on i really appreciate it you're welcome Glad to be here. Um, what is, I mean, let's just start peeling into the layers, not just of your tournament, uh, your, your, the, the tournament trail, but also just of you. Like, How long have you been in the area for? I grew up here. I was born in Alexandria, Virginia. My oh, parents cool. are, my parents lived there. I mean, my mother was born in Stafford, moved to Alexandria as a young girl. My father was born in Old Town. Oh, wow. Uh, I went to schools in Fairfax County. Uh, so I've been here forever, 71 years. <laughs> I was, um, I was born in Fairfax and I lived in Vienna, Virginia until I was 13. So I think that was like 2003, I think before we moved out to Western Loudoun. So I'm very familiar with that area. Yeah. So I I saw it when it was nothing. Most people don't realize how small the city of Alexandria used to be. It ended at the Masonic temple. I mean, that was it. That was Alexandria and they kept annexing property. Until they move to where they are now, they can't get any bigger. That's so crazy. I can't that's imagine. Why I, what... work. I worked in the city of Alexandria. I was a police officer there for almost 30 years. Oh, wow. So, yeah, that's changed a lot then. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Tremendously. I, I couldn't so has all, The whole area has. I mean, it's just everything here has grown up. I, mean, I couldn't like imagine being a cop right now in Alexandria. Like compare and contrast, yeah. like from 30 years ago till now, it's like a different world. Well, I retired in 2006, and that was before all the major problems started happening, really. Uh, I wouldn't want to be a cop now. Uh, no way. You know, just everybody's against you anymore. There, You know, there's no help. There's no friendship there. I mean, there is some, don't get me wrong, but it's just there's more anger towards the police now than I've ever seen it, ever. Sure. So I'm glad I'm out of it. What? How, what is your story in the fishing world about how you got into it? Because a lot of people, DC for the, for my listeners that aren't in this DC, like weird hub, it's a weird transplant area. You got your natives like me who've, who've lived here my whole life, but yeah. there's a lot of people that come here for government work and you don't realize that the Potomac river has fish in it. It's not just dead bodies and pollution. It, it's a big fish hub. So like, how did you get into it? Well, as a young kid, I used to ride my bike. I, my parents moved down to what's called New Alexandria, which is just off the uh, parkway near Bellhaven Park. And I ride my bike down there and fish off the shore as a kid. The only thing we caught was carp or catfish or eels. I mean, I, I never saw a bass down there. But that's how I initially got into the fishing. Uh, my mother's from Stafford County, and the family has a large amount of property down there on the water. And as a young kid, I helped my uncles crab, haul seine nets. I mean, we did it all. I mean, you know, just I wasn't down there all the time, but I went down there a lot. And when we went, we did help. So I, I've been around the river since I was a young boy. And uh, when I started, kind of got away from it, you know, just didn't fish anymore. You know, I was working, going to college and different things. And, uh, you know, just 
uh, I didn't do it. And then I went to work for the police department in Alexandria and I met up with an officer, Dave Estes, uh, who we worked on the same squad and he had an old bomber bass boat with a 25 horsepower motor on it. And he asked me if I wanted to go fishing and I had to go buy a fishing rod because I, all my stuff was beat up or dead, or it was at my dad's house. And, you know, it was old ancient stuff, steel rods. I mean, you know, you can't even imagine fishing with it anymore. But anyway, I bought a couple of fishing rods and he told me what to buy. And we started bass fishing, went to, went to the Potomac river, went to Lunga, went to, you know, Fountainhead. We just fished around. And, uh, that was in about 78, give or take a little 77. And we just started to get into fishing a little more. And we both bought Bass Tracker Bass Boats. Oh, that's so cool. From a show over that was over in Maryland years ago. There used to be one of the fishing shows that came up. It was in a hotel over there. Really? And I ordered them from, uh, boy, I wish I could remember his name. The guy had a, uh, his place was down on Route 64. Don Foreman. He used to be a big time fisherman at the time, but he ran a uh, boat store. And he came up to the show and we both bought bass trackers with 60 horsepower motors on them. And that was my first boat. Dude, that, that is freaking cool. Like it's so crazy to think on that side of things. Um, you know, and and won't, won't mention most of this, but like, even like talking to Charlie in the past, when he talked about how the gear and tackle have changed and like to get a decent rod and reel combo back then you had to spend a ton of money. And now a hundred bucks can get you some pretty top tier stuff that was nowhere near the same level it was, you know, back in the day. And it's just so interesting to think about like how far that has come. Oh, it's just, I mean, I, I went to, I don't know, it was probably Kmart cause we didn't have a Walmart back then, uh, and bought just a, a spinning rod with a spinning reel on it. And it was whatever they had. And, you know, and that's how that was my first rod into bass fishing. And, uh, you know, Looking at it now, I, I it's like so archaic compared to what I use today. But uh, you know, it was it was good. Caught fish with it. You know, we had fun, and we eventually got into more and more quality fishing gear as the time went on, as it became available too. What what was Fountainhead like? I I, I can't imagine that place. Like when you and guys for, again for the people that aren't local, you you drive to Fountainhead and you're in a major metropolitan area, and all of a sudden you, you bob and weave, and then you're down to this like beautiful lake. Like what was that like back in the day, and how did it fish? Well, there was no houses. I mean, there was very, there was almost no houses on that lake back in those days. I mean, compared to what it is now, uh, I I hadn't been on Fountainhead in years until about two months ago, and I went down there with a friend, and I was amazed at the the homes that line the shorelines now, Mm -hmm. uh, just, it, you know, it, the lake was still the same. I still remember basic shape, but you know, when you drive around every corner and there's nothing but these big million dollar homes sitting everywhere, uh, you just go, wow, you know, how much is, is is so much changed and, but the fishing is good. It's probably better now than it was back then. So. That's yeah. And, and, you know, credit to the Virginia DWR and just for how they're managing yeah. that and stocking it because yeah, it still pumps out insane bags. Like it's oh, yeah. stupid how much weight comes yeah. out of there. Uh, I'll get into some stories about fishing on the Potomac river years ago and the guys yes. are going to be shocked at the weights we used to catch. Well, I mean, that's a good little segue there to like, you know, we you know, talked about fountainhead and then like the Potomac, like yeah, how much is the the, the cover on that place has changed because I've had different guests on, you know, Mr. Chaconis, and he talked about yeah. when you have these cyclical cycles of like a lot of vegetation and no vegetation. Uh, what, what was it like back then? Did it still have hydrilla or is that more of a new thing? Uh, well, hydrilla, the, actually grass did not come into the Potomac River. And I had to look this up because I want to make sure what year it was in 1982. Before wow. that, there was almost no grass of any kind in the river, except for a few isolated places where you could find lily pads. Hmm. There was no grass in the river, none period. It all, it all came in back in there. And I remember the story, the park service planted a thing in a controlled area in the Anacostia to see if it would grow. And that's when it took off. Hmm. It started there in a, in a, a container that they had out there in the water, just a wire container, and it spread. 
and it spread like crazy back in the 90s. I mean, it went down the river like wildfire. But before that, we structured fish. You fish something, trees, docks, piers, rock piles, old barges. Uh, the river's full of them, especially up north. You get up around Bellhaven, there's there's probably five barges out there in the flat. That's so if you crazy. Know where they're at. And that's what we fished. The Wilson Bridge was one of our favorite places to fish, the old Wilson Bridge. Caught many a good bag of fish off that river as time went on. Where where did you guys launch from at that time? Was I mean, Lisavania wasn't a thing, right? Was it Smallwood? Uh, or? No, there was only two places, three places to launch on the Virginia side. Bellhaven, which has been there forever. Uh, Pohick and the Amsco Creek, the marina down there where the restaurant is. The guy who ran it had his house on the hill. And you, you went up and put the put your three bucks or two bucks or whatever it was back then in a cup on his front doorstep. And you launched your boat and you parked in the gravel yard in front of his house. Wow. And the ramp was very steep. And uh, you could go over. To, we used that to go to tournaments at Smallwood. That's so cool. That's I, just, that's... I mean, it, it, there's just there was no Lisavania, you know, I and mean, nothing's really changed other than Lisavania. Yeah. You know, up here on this end of the river. Anyway, that's the only right. new place to launch. Where, where were most of the tournaments then when you guys were competing back then? Were you mostly focusing on the DC area since it has more hardcover? Um, well, we used to, yeah, pretty much so. We we would never go south, almost never, except for every once in a while we'd go down to Madawin, go back in the creek and fish lily pads. But that was occasionally. Most of the time we fished hardcover. Hmm. I mean, we, you know, buoy 56 right just down the just down the river a little bit from pohick you know there's there's places over by marshall hall where there's pilings out in the water there's pilings in the water by mount vernon there's pilings just north of that in front of swan creek is a bunch of pilings and uh, once you get up past you get up near bellhaven there are multiple things to fish hogs island is a huge pile of barges and out in front of hogs island there's like three or four different wrecks that are out there huge wrecks and they're just barely under the water uh then you you got up to you know you had north point south point right there at, at you know just below the wilson bridge above the wilson bridge there's a huge barge pile of barges you know the spoils really wasn't there as it is now because it was it was more natural and hmm. all the concrete wasn't there i mean that was part of the old wilson bridge when they tore it down not I the oldest one. If they repaved the Wilson Bridge. They put all that concrete in there. I didn't know that at all. That's really Ken Penrod cool. had something to do with that. He worked hard to get them to dump that concrete there. Yeah, but they were going to haul it away. Interesting. I didn't know he had that much pull. I'm sorry? So I didn't know he had that much pull. That's a lot of pull to get him to say, like, hey, you're going to put well, this here. He, he was, you know, he was strong. He worked hard back then, you know, um, uh, helping the fishery and, and everything else. He was one of the first guides on the river back then. And, you know, he, he really worked hard with them to get them to do that. And it saved them money because they were talking oh. about hauling it down to the Chesapeake Bay somewhere and doing the same thing. And what they did is they took the slabs off of the Wilson Bridge and just lowered them down to barges and then took them over there and, and put them all across the front because that, that was a hunk of land at one time. Right there in the front where all those pieces of the concrete are, that was above the water land. And it, it was eroding away. So he, you know, saved the little land mass that was there by dumping concrete all over it. And then he put that big, you know, the big pile in the middle of it. But, uh, that, you know, that, that is such a great government decision. Why don't we just take these rocks and let's drive them 10 hours this way versus just putting them in right here? Yeah. <laughs> when you think of the river like that and as it, has changed to now um and i guess this is more of like a, a bigger question but what have been the biggest changes is it the vegetation if you had to think of the big ones would it be that one or something else i think the grass made a huge difference in the river period i mean you know i i can little history when i first started fishing tournaments it was an eight fish limit <sighs> per person and when you fished a team tournament you weighed in eight 16 fish and I remember tournaments on the Potomac River and the Chickahominy because we we ran up and down the state. We fished all, all, the, all the places back in the old days. And uh, But on the river, 
you could weigh 16 fish and you wouldn't have 20 pounds. And that was a good limit. I mean, it was, it was many, many guys, the old guys that are still around will remember those days when you didn't have a 20 pound bag, you know, cause they were all one pounders. That's all you had. You, you hardly ever caught a big fish in a river. What? And then the grass, then the grass came. And my partner and I, Dave Estes, who I fished with for 34 years, uh, and he, he and I, we, we, we held off fishing the grass. We said, as long as we can keep catching these big fish, of course, the fish had gotten bigger everywhere at the time on the structure, we're going to keep fishing it until the grass boys start beating us. And eventually they caught up and started beating us. So we had to, we had to learn how to fish grass and we learned in a green way. I flipped green. I, we learned how to flip grass before most people ever knew what flipping was. Mm. Uh, my first flipping stick that I ever had was uh, an eagle claw that some, they came out with a collapsible flipping stick. And then they had a series Collapse. one. Berkeley had a series one flipping stick. And the series one was so much better than the old eagle claw one. Uh, and then that was before all these rod companies came out. There was only two or three rod companies out there. I mean, you had, you know, Fenwick, Berkeley, you know, there was Zebco. You know. Zebco. Oh, my yeah. gosh. <laughs> I mean, they were all that. You didn't have all these rods that we have now, all the, you know, all the stuff you can buy now. Forget that. You didn't have those options. They weren't available. Nobody sold them. I mean, it just, they, nobody had developed them yet. You know, so, and the, the grass in Greenway, probably in the early 90s, was just a solid milfoil bed from one end to the other. And it just kept going. It went north, it went south. Everything on the shoreline had, had milfoil on it. On the, especially on the Maryland shoreline, had more milfoil than the Virginia side did. And we learned how to flip fishing Greenway. I had two bags. My partner and I had two bags that were 38 pounds and 40 pounds out of Greenway Flats. For, for that was for 10 fish back in those days when it changed eventually changed and it just shows you how much has changed i mean you could even the chick we'd go down to the chick and catch some better fish because the, the chickahominy and the rich and the james you could get some bigger fish down there and you might have 21 22 23 pounds 25 pounds or a, a eight you know 16 pack limit and that was like when we fished the old virginia teams because they went down there all the time that's so, so it, it, it's just, it's interesting when you think it's not that long ago. It really is not. You're talking 10, 20 years to see that big yeah, a little change. longer than that. I mean, more, like, more, so, like, more like 30. <laughs> oh, yeah. God. Has it really been 30 years? Oh, shit. It has, hasn't it? Well, you're talking the 90s. We're, yeah. we're, in, we're in 2024. Holy crap. Yeah, yeah I can't I count. Know, early 90s. Old too. <laughs> uh, I, I can tell you that I fished the Virginia Federation. I was in both region one and then we split up and became region nine. I fished that. And, uh, my partner who was like my best friend, Dave Estes and I just decided one time back in the nineties that we just weren't going to go out of town anymore. We didn't need to drive down the Kerr and Gaston and Smith mountain and the James because the best fishing on the land was right there in the Potomac river in our backyard. And we fished any and every tournament we could fish. And, I have many plaques and trophies hanging around the house from where people hated us because we became very well known as a couple of guys you had to beat. We're, we're going to be getting to some of your trophies. I want to see some of your bling bling here in a minute. But I, what's interesting to me is, is you said something about we would catch a bunch, but we wouldn't catch 20 pounds. And I know that there's so many fantastic people that are in the comment section saying like, well, the fishing wasn't as good as it's always been, blah, blah, blah. Where did that stem from? This idea of like, well, well, it was always better back then when it comes to fish catches. But like you said, it's I, maybe not necessarily true. I'll totally disagree with that. I mean, I've I've been fishing, like I said, I've been fishing a river since the seventies, and a lot of these guys. There was a time, and we'll get to that in in the in the late nineties, early two thousands, when the weights were awesome. I mean, huge weights. 30 pounds, LAPR tournament series. There was some, and even in Potomac teams uh, before I ran it. I mean, it was not unusual to get a 30 pound bag for five fish. And there, so was, about 10, there was 10 pounders being 
weighed in at the certified station. And most of them were coming from down down south between Quantico and Aquia. So you're saying, so you're thinking the peak of the, or let me rephrase it. What do you think the peak of the river was? When do you think the river was at its best if you had a five-year span? Uh, probably in the, in the nineties up and up into the, and I'm not sure about the 2000, early two thousands, there was a, there was a five or six, seven year period back then when I can remember huge bags of fish coming in. I mean, just, uh, I don't have the records because I didn't run, but you know, what is now Potomac teams until 2004 and I didn't keep. I didn't start my website until later, so I didn't have the records of even some of the big bags that we weighed. Well, uh, a- anecdotally, know. from what you saw, sort of speak back then, but if you're seeing ten pounders weighed in, that's probably going to be the time frame. <laughs> well, that was probably mostly in the late '90s, early 2000s. Uh, you know, and it was there was just a time period when the grass had been just awesome for years. I mean, you could go anywhere you wanted on the river and there was milfoil beds and it was only milfoil beds. You didn't have hydrilla hmm. and uh, it really was, it was just beds of solid milfoil and you could just, yeah, I mean, you had to flip it. You know, the, the best way to catch them was use a flipping stick and with a, you know, half or three quarter ounce jig and a pig on it. Cause we didn't have all the stuff we do now, but uh, you know, I mean, that's what I use. I, I still have probably, five dozen of them on the wall uh, hanging on the cards from the ones I used to use because I bought them by the pack. And, you know, uh, but it, that's what, you know, you just walk, you went along dropping your, your jig down between the grass clumps and shaking it up and down. And all of a sudden it'd go thump and you'd oh, set the hook, you'd set the thing. hook and battle was on, you know, we didn't have braid back then. There was no braid. What did we you used use? Everything was mono. Oh my God. <laughs> You know, I, I finally found, I can, I can't remember when, but I finally found copolymer and, you know, and I used that because I liked it because it didn't stretch as much as mono and you could find, you know, it, it was, that was one of the early things. I mean, braid wasn't out. I mean, it's, it's strange. My father had braid, but it wasn't called braid back then on some of his old reels. Huh? It was, it was more just cotton. It was actually, it was, it was like cloth fishing line. I mean, it was, it was made out of like a cotton material. So it wasn't quite braid, but it was, it was like that. And it was, there's probably a name for it. And somebody will come in and say, oh, yeah, you should have known what the name was. I can't remember what they called it, but you know, I've been using braid for so long. I forget the names of all the old stuff, but, but basically everybody fished mono. I mean, there was no, we didn't have braid back then. What pound test were you using? Like for mono, like. 30, 25, 30, whatever you could get. The hook set must have been fantastic back then. <laughs> well, I, I can give you a little story about some hook setting. When uh, I was out, we were fishing in Greenway one day and the fishing were, the fish were biting and I had my old series one flipping stick and I set up on a fish and it was like five pounds and I broke my rod and I almost cried. I mean, I'm going, like, what am I going to do? Uh, I was using all stars back then, and I had two WR2s, which was the strongest worm rod they sold at that time. And I went to one of those, and I eventually broke that. And then I went to my second one and broke that. You've been working out. And I, Good and I caught all those fish. We caught every one of those fish, and we came in with like, you know, 30 some pounds in that tournament. And I went up to a new tackle shop, which was Delta Tackle in the city of Alexandria, run, where it was run by Barney De Kemper. And I bought my first G. Loomis fishing rod. And it was a it was a six power worm rod. It was like a pool cue. Mm. It really was. But I could I could flip fish into the boat with that rod. But it was only seven foot tall. And eventually they came out with the IMX flipping stick which I had two of. I eventually bought two of them. Oh, that's so cool. And then I bought the GLXs. And I how still much, have my- How much was that, by the way, if I could ask? Well, back then they were like 250. Oh my you know, God, it's a <laughs> I mean, that was still a lot. That was a lot of money back then. Yeah, that's true. I mean, you know, people don't think about it. Hey, when I started working for the police department, I was making $12,200 a year in 1976. 
Oh my God. And that was good money back then. <laughs> I left an $8,000 job to go to the police department. Come on, you know, and I had Benny's too. I mean, that was great. But I'm just saying, you think yeah. about spending $250 on a rod, that was a lot of money. It really yeah. was. I guess, yeah. But we were winning. Amazing. We were winning enough money that I wasn't paying for them because we were, we kept winning tournaments. And it, it wasn't huge amounts of money because the tournaments were small. I mean, you know, you didn't have any big tournaments back then. I mean, Potomac teams, I remember many. Matter of fact, in my early days, I had, when I started keeping records, I only had 47 boats. I mean, and that was probably up from when Arnold used to run it when he'd have 25 or 30. And, you know, that was the same way with most of the tournaments, except for maybe the Metropolitan Police Department did a big tournament and they they went out of their way to raffle and everything else. and they had some hundred boat tournaments out of Smallwood that were insane. We thought back then a hundred boats. I mean, where are you, where are you going to go fishing? There's going to be a hundred boats out there. And now that's common. I mean, a hundred boats so cool. is nothing on the river anymore. It's it just, I really do hope. And, um, sorry about that. We'll, we'll get, we'll get into this eventually, but like, yeah, like this is not like we're going to just be reminiscing. Cause I, I think, I think, we could do things now as anglers and, and hopefully pressure people in authority places to get the river back to where it was, especially when it comes to the grass, grass and supplemental stocking. Um, it just, there has to be something we can do to help bring that back. Well, you know, the, the grass, it, it's, it's been weird. I, I mean, I, I can, I can give you a good example and I can't quite remember exactly the year, but it was in the nineties. Uh, we had fished Greenway flats and one of the many tournaments that we were in, and it was a solid grass mat of milfoil. The next week, we went to the Chickahominy and fished a region tournament or whatever was down there. I, don't, I can't remember which one it was. But when we came back the week after, because we had to work, so we only went out when we could. But, you know, went out the next week. That's two weeks later. And Greenway Flats was dead. The grass was dead. And we swore that somebody poisoned it. I mean, why would it die like that? But, you know, I've seen that happen now multiple times on the river and other places. And I think it just goes through cycles. I'm not sure if it's just the river was so dirty and so full of pollution that the grass ate up all the nutrients and the muck that was on the bottom. I mean, you know, it was just black. I can tell you what we know what it was, but. It was from D.C. dumping raw sewage in the river 24-7. And probably some other jurisdictions, too. I mean, it just wasn't D.C., but they were the worst offender. But uh, but it's still happening today. I mean, you, we're still seeing that. You know, uh, There's places on the river right now that last year was a solid hydrilla bed. And it's one of the spots I love to fish. And there's no grass. There's none there right now. I have no idea why I didn't come back. Just like it's gone. I, I'm really thinking it has to do with the water quality. It, it always comes down to that stuff. It's interesting. Um, Joe Rogan had on his show a guy that worked for the River Keepers organization, and he talked about the the Delaware River system, or the yeah, I think it's the Delaware the, the Hudson River system, and how it the color of the river depended on what color the Ford factor used to be painting their vehicles. It used to be that bad back <laughs> in the day, and I it's can just like me up there. And it's just to think about that the grass is definitely affected by that. And I think we got to just start bringing more attention to this kind of thing, because like you said, like I remember when the whole DC was a carpet and then they started to work on the bridge. And when they started to do working on the bridge, all of a sudden the next couple of years, that's all gone. And well, some it, of that's mud. I can tell you yeah, another yeah. little story. If we have a very, very rainy spring, which we didn't even have this year. And this year I'm seeing more milfoil than I've seen in years. There is milfoil beds out there that haven't been there in years. And it's just, there was no rain. We didn't, we had a real mild winter. We had no rain in the spring and the grass was able to grow. And it's, it's growing like grass. And I think mud alone, just the dirty water coming down the river hurts the grass as much as anything does. It gets so muddy that you can, you can see that in places on the river when you're in there. And if you touch a piece of grass, the mud floats off of it and the mm. grass isn't green anymore. It's kind of a brownish looking yellow because it's not getting the sunlight to make it grow. So yeah, that, that in itself filter. probably hurts the grass as much as anything. Yeah. And, and grass is a filter. And, and so it's going to cling yeah. to oh, the yes. grass. And so 
if, if the grass is already and guys this is just a quick lesson for the for my viewers there so if grass is already established and you have a couple muddy days it's not going to hurt it but if the grass is trying to grow up in muddy water it's hard because it needs that that sunlight penetration to yeah especially sport. when it's down deep you know yeah exactly I mean, a good example chicks amongst this year is like packed with milfoil hadn't been there in years i mean two or three four years it hasn't been like it is i mean it's basically milfoil beds for acres right now and it's not the best of fishing in there because there wasn't any grass hardly in there last year and the fish kind of i don't know what they do or where they go but they're just not in there in numbers great numbers mm -hmm. anyway they're in there but they're just not the big numbers aren't there right now but they'll come back speaking of, of fish moving around what happened to nanjamoin and port tobacco that to me is so fascinating when you read ken penrod or, or skeet reese going back up in there a thousand years ago uh, well, i had guys that i fished with brian wosard and his partner used to run from pohick to nanjamoy all the time oh my God. <laughs> and i i made a couple i made a couple of trips down there but that was back in the dark ages when the boats didn't have the gas they do now i mean my first big boat was this 18 foot pro craft with a 150 gt on it that only had a 20 gallon tank how long would that take you <laughs> Oh, well, it wasn't it, how long it was going to take you. It's how much gas you could carry to get back. Oh, my, oh God. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> because that old 150 GT would, would eat. It would pass almost any boat on the water, but it wouldn't. you weren't coming back because you run out of gas. Mm. I mean, it just the, the way they were, they were horrible. They were gas hogs. The Mercs were better, but not a whole lot. I used to carry six extra gallons to run from Pohick to, to Mallows Bay and back, and I had to use that six gallons. Because nobody cared about a fuel economy back then. I mean, those motors were just designed to burn gas. Yeah. And they did. But, uh, I mean, it, the grass disappeared in, in Nanjimoy. Nanjimoy had an awesome grass bed in front of it. And so did Port of the Tobacco. The, the front of those places were completely loaded with milfoil. And then the milfoil disappeared. And hmm. I haven't been down to either one of those places in years. I don't even know if there's any grass in there now. Nobody ever talks about them anymore. So I figured nobody goes. Yeah, yeah. It, it, I, before we were going to record this, I asked him the questions and one came up as I always talked about that because I was going through the uh, the guys as, as we're recording this episode, um, the Invitational, Sack Warehouse Invitationals was there. And so I went through some history and, and I found the old article about him up in Nanjimoy. And I was like, you know what? That's that's a blast from the past. I have not heard Nanjimoy in a long time. And the more people I talk to, are like, yeah, that place is dead. It's like, oh, is, is it pollution or is it something yeah. else? But yeah, it sounds like it's just, it's the vegetation cycles and there's just nothing going in there right yeah. now. Well, when Skeet Reese went down there, he went down there and fished the wood. Mm -hmm. The back of that creek is loaded with wood. It's one of those places where there's just, there's tons of wood all over the shoreline. And, and, you know, if the fish are there, that's where they're going to be. They're going to be on the wood. And that's what he did. He went back in the creek and fished the wood because there was no grass in the front of that place when he was down there. I remember that tournament. I mean, I, I can still remember watching him when they had it on TV like a month later or whatever it was because nothing yeah. was live back then. But anyway, yeah. you know, you, you could say, I, I know right where he's at. He's in Nanjimore Creek, you know, knew where he was. And I think um, that was the year that um, Alton, no, George, was it? Somebody punched out in front of Aquia, I think that year. I forget who yeah. it was. But uh, yeah, guys in the chat, eventually when this thing drops, you can let me know who that was. Because I, I know he won the year before or vice versa. But yeah, that, that was that was a long time ago. But, th but then we had something else happen, which is a, a fun, hot topic, which is the snakes and the blue cats. And they started to get in here. Well, I know what the biologists say. I know what the river keepers say about it. But what did you see when all that went down? With the snakeheads? Snakeheads and the blue cats. Yeah. Well, initially, I, I was worried like everybody else about the snakeheads because they kept screaming how, how bad they were going to do the the bass. And uh, I had the fortunate uh, times to go to Pohick, and the Virginia Tech guys were launching out of Pohick on a regular basis, going across the creek and shocking snakeheads. And they were bringing them back and flaying them to get what was ever in it. And I talked to them multiple times and they kept telling me, this is what we're finding. And it was mostly carp. 90% of the fish they had in there that they could identify were carp. And I saw them. I mean, I looked at them. They had them laying on the table right there in Pohit because they were cutting them open when we'd come in and out of there. And That's so I didn't, you know, I figured it wasn't too bad. 
you know, and, and the carp, you know, the snakeheads, we figured out they live on the bank for the most part. You know, you don't catch them out all over the place. You catch a few, but most of them are on the shoreline. So, you know, the blue channel, I don't know. I, I've caught my share of them accidentally on a, they <laughs> like bass lures too. So I've had several huge blue cats, but I'm not sure what they do to the, to the population. When did you start catching them? Or when, when was the first time, if you could remember, that you started to, to see them? That's, I don't know how many years ago that was. It was near the beginning. They weren't as big as they are now. Mm -hmm. They were a lot smaller. You know, even the snakeheads were smaller. You know, of course, I went through the period. I've had two snakeheads over 15 pounds. And oh both, of those came, both of those came in front of Mount Vernon on the same day on a wow. buzzbait. Dude, that's a that's a dragon right there. That's awesome. Well, I saw one over twenty five. It came out of it came out of Chicks and Monks, and and the guy said he was going to take it in and weigh it, and it looked like it was twenty five pounds. It was huge. World. It was the biggest snakehead I've ever seen in my life, and I don't know whatever happened to it. All right, here we go. So, guys, here actually, I'll, I'll just show the screen because I I just. That way, everyone that goes out there can start chasing these records. We got, so the national record is 17 pounds, 12 ounces. So 20 would blow that. That is a big ass animal. Holy crap. If 17 pounds. So they can easily get probably 25, 30. I, I, I could have swore somebody caught one 19 out of Occoquan. I remember it. I remember that fish being talked about. I don't know if that, that might be. That's got to be close to that. I mean, you know, oh, here we go. but it was like 19 pounds. Now, I don't know if he ever registered or not. You know, here it could have been one of those ones where it was just weighed in on some scales and it said it was 19 pounds. And Yeah, that's interesting. I, I'll, I'll do some more background digging on that because that'd be interesting to know what the world record is. I, I thought it was around 1920-ish. I felt like 17 was low. That might be the Maryland record, but we'll, but we'll find out. That's prop that could be because I I know I've seen some that have been caught at right around the 20 pound range somewhere posted. I just I don't keep track of them, but that's interesting. Yeah, and the fact is that it doesn't seem like they've had that big of an. It hasn't been as bad as people thought, and I think it's honestly if, if there's anything going on with the river, it's a death by a thousand cuts. It's multiple factors. It's not just one thing that yeah. has created some of these issues. Um, and the other thing too is like, is that is brought up a lot is pressure. And, and you hear that from certain audiences out there that there's just more pressure than there has ever been. I mean, do you think that's, there's any validity to that or not? Well, you know, the pressure is growing at the same time, the fishery's grown and, you know, people can run further than they ever used to. I mean, I, I remember nobody ever ran down to Aquaya. you know, I mean, they, nobody went to Aquaya. period. It was too far away. You know, the boats just couldn't, really couldn't go there. And Potomac Creek, forget that. And you know, Nanjimoy, I mean, I, you know, that was unheard, that was unheard of, uh, you know, and it's just, and the numbers of fish in the river and, and I can, my stats that I have over the years that I've kept them since I started running Potomac teams uh, shows that they're there, the weights are there and it's back, it's every year, it's consistent. And, you know, we've had a couple of, Poorly years, you know, and they're not really bad, but they're they're less than others. But and that just seems to be the up and downs of of any fishery. I mean, that's, you got that. And if you have a bad spring and we don't have a good spawn, then all of a sudden you don't have a lot of new new ones running around. You know, well, I, I I think this is a good segue then to getting into the the, the Potomac teams. How did all this for the people that don't know? How did this come together? Where 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 you got it? Okay, many years ago, uh, the first tournament that my partner and I fished was Potomac Bassmasters, and that was a federation club, and they're still in existence today. I know some, I still know some guys that are in it. Uh, they're not, uh, they don't do the region anymore. They're kind of just a club now. They've gotten away from all the federation tournament stuff, but uh, they started running in 1974. I had to look that up. Uh, Arnold Aspen started having open tournaments in Pohick. And I didn't fish the first one until about 1979. And because we weren't, I wasn't fishing back then. I wasn't in, involved in it. And 
uh, fished it every year. We started fishing the entire circuit. They were all held out of Pohick for 90% of the time. Uh, one year, uh, Arnold lived behind the marina in Piscataway Creek, and he ran his tournaments out of there, but nobody liked it because it was limited parking. It was, you know, terrible to get around the beltway across the bridge and everything. So finally that went away after one year, but he almost consistently had it in Pohick. And uh, I started helping Arlen, Arnold weighing fish because none of his club guys would show up to help him. And I got to the point where they were just more in the club. Nobody wanted to help him. So I started helping him weigh fish. Uh, and eventually he uh, came down with Parkinson's and mm. it kept getting so bad that he couldn't even read his own writing. And that's when he decided to give it up. And that was in 2004. And that's when I took, he, the club didn't want it. So they offered it, you know, they said, Arnold said I could have it. So I took it over. I renamed it to Potomac teams because there was still Potomac Bassmasters as a club. I just changed the name up and I've been running it ever since. Now, are you doing this all by yourself? Like the whole operation or who, how does that work? Pretty much so. I mean, all the paperwork is me. Oh my gosh, dude. I, I, I do I do everything to do. Uh, I mean, eventually got the website. You know, I have a website, Potomac uh, Bass, I'm sorry, PotomacTeams.com. Uh, I've had that up for many years and I started posting the results. Uh, I don't do many pictures because, you know, Every, but now anymore, you, you can see them almost live on Facebook or your FaceTime or whatever when they're showing it from the dock anyway. But, um, you know, I show the winners. I post the weights of everybody. I have season standings, you know, and I do have uh, I have one team that uh, helps me. They're my weigh master. I used to weigh the fish and somebody else would write them down, but he, he decided he wanted to weigh the fish. And I would write them down. So that's the only thing that's really changed. Uh, my fishing partner helps. He he checks the boats in at the end of the day. Uh, I go down to the park. Five. I'm there before. I'm there at four o'clock in the morning before the gate even opens. Get down there first. Sit there and register everybody and get the blast off out of there uh, at six. How many ever boats there are. Um, and of course, they've gone up over the years. Uh, I'm having. A, a fantastic season this year with boat numbers. Uh, but you know, it's me. It's basically, I do all the paperwork. Oh I order gosh. the trophies. I arrange for the polygraph test to be run. You know, that's all me. Are you, and I do it for fun. And that's what I was going to say too. It's like, are you being compensated for your time? Or are you just doing this for fun? Because very, very little compensation. I do it for fun. I pay and out, I pay out 89.7%. So and, that tells and, you, you know, I, I, I'm not in this for the money. Yeah. And, and that's kind of what I wanted to tie in is like, so a, a classic example is like when you have parents that yell at umpires at a 10 year old game Yeah, and it's like, that dude is there and he's not even making enough to, to make a ham sandwich. He's there cause he loves it. And I think I, I can't imagine some of the shit that you've had to deal with <laughs> when you're doing <laughs> something like this. And it's not like you're, you're, you're complaining to the head of Bassmasters who gets paid quite well for this job. It's, it's a local thing that you're doing really for fun and, and for this community that you've really helped grow and build. And people just need to understand that and like what level we're at here, you know, before you say words and stuff. Well, my, I, I don't like the four letter word work because I retired almost 18 years ago and I haven't done that four letter word since then other than Potomac teams. Um, and I, I've been fishing tournaments for so long. I know what people want. I know what they like. I know what I want. And I run my tournament in a manner that I think everybody likes. And I get a lot of compliments over how I run my circuit. I mean, we weigh in, you know, I, I've been having between 80, 80 and 100 boats in every tournament. The tournament doesn't even, the weigh-in doesn't start till 3.05 because I need four guys there to do my weigh-in. And one guy's doing the boat check-in. So we have to wait till he's done. And we weigh them all in in 40 minutes, 45 minutes. They go That's and insane. it's a bag line. They have to use my bags because I don't want them to kill fish. Mm. So there's a limited number of bags they can use and it works. It does work. We do it very well and we can get through there and get them weighed and, and get the money paid out. Dude, that's, and, 
I can't imagine. Like, I'm just trying to think about like if I would want to do that for every of my Saturdays. But more power to you to be able to do this um, consistently. Like, I, I, yeah, I mean, hats off. That's that's freaking awesome. Well, thank you. Well, you know, I've, I've been doing it for a long time. I mean, it's since 2004 to now, so I'm almost 20 years of running it myself. So, well, then let's get into the fun. Let's get into some uh, some data points. I'm actually kind of excited to see this part of it. All right. What would you, what do you want? <laughs> Pop it up right there. Um, yeah, I mean, like, see, let's, that's so much data. For numbers let's, or? Yeah, like, um, which, how, I was trying to think about how we could do this in a way that people would enjoy it. I mean, honestly, I think we could start with what, what years really stand out to you as, so usually with data, you're going to have, a, you're going to have a high and a trough. Like, what were some peaks that you were seeing? Um, I, I can just guess by the the weights, you know, uh, the number of teams I've had. I mean, when I first started, when I moved when I moved to Leesylvania, and I didn't keep many rec- I didn't keep a lot of records when I was in Poke. I, I just ran the tournament. You know, I didn't keep a record. I didn't have a web page, uh, and I, I just ran the tournament. And in 2010, I started the website, and I've been keeping it ever since. And I started out the first couple of years, I had 47 boats, uh, you know, uh, 40, 58 boats, 70 boats, 74 boats. And then all of a sudden in 14, I started running 100 boats, you know, here and there. And, you know, just, uh, you know, that was teams for the season. That was not just for every tournament. That's how many teams I had that fished the season, you know, when they fished all eight or 10 tournaments. I, I now fish have 10, but they, they fish them all. And as you can see from the sheet and the weights have, you know, improved over the years. I mean, some years are better than the others, but they've been fairly consistent. If you go back to 2010, the top weight for that year for a five fish bag was 20 pounds. And here it is in 2022 weights, the top weight was 22 pounds. So the river has been consistent. I mean, you know, those couple of years where it was 19 something, but I mean, every year it's been consistent. So a lot of people who complain about the river going up and down, I have stats that show that it's pretty much stayed the same. It, do you think the weights, and, and I'll sometimes say this a lot, when you compare and contrast, let's say the BFLs, this is a great thing, a BFL with the Potomac teams. Is that apples to oranges or apples to apples when you compare it, if it's the same time of year and everything? Well, a lot of people call my guys river rats and they say they can't beat the river rats because they're always out there. And I I have I have a large group of regular guys that they consistently catch fish. You know, they might have a bad tournament here and there, but you can almost always count those guys. And, you know, with mine, you can't go anywhere. It's Potomac teams. You know, the BFL, everybody's got this thing in their head that they're going to become a a semi-pro or a pro and they're going to go off and fish the ABA or the All-American or whatever it is they're going to fish, you know, and that's what they're trying to do. And, you know, a lot of people have done that and some have done well. I mean, we just had four guys from Virginia fishing last weekend in the in the uh, major league fishing tournament and they all did quite well. Wow. You know, and and. Most of those guys had fished my circuit at one time or another. So that's crazy. I mean, you know, and there's other guys who have gone on and, and done well. And there's other people just disappear. You know, you see them for a few years and then you just don't see them anymore. And, you know, I just I wonder why, where they are. Did they move away? Some of them did. Some of them didn't. You know, it, it's just so many. And I think you also. And again, that's why I have you on the show now. It's like there was like a couple of seven pounders caught this year, right? Or, or around that, correct? Uh, we've had um, our biggest fish this year so far. And I, I'm i sure it's a seven pounder, but I don't have the numbers in front of me. Uh, I've had in the last few years, I go back to 2010. I can give you some weights. 693. So these are in order from 2010 until now. Okay. 693, 662, 728. Now that wow. was in 12. 612, 611, 633. 17 was 756. 18 was 832. 
19 was 806. 20, that was a COVID gear. I only had five tournaments because they wouldn't let me have tournaments at all. Uh, was 638. 21 was 711. And last year was 690. So yeah, interesting that spike there in the early teens. That's interesting. Yeah. And that's about the, that oh. could be the same time. I'm, I, I wish I knew when uh, uh, the LAPR had their peak. And there was some nine pounders weighed in in his tournament. I mean, there wow. was multi, there was one tournament where a guy came in and said, man, I got it. I was standing right there because I was fishing the tournament. He goes, I got it. I got an eight pounder. I said, you're too late. There's already been a nine weight. He's going, what? You know, oh he, the guy had an eight pounder and it didn't even, he wasn't even close to catching big fish. So well, there was a peak. There was a peak time there. And, and it was probably in the middle of that somewhere. And you'd have to talk to uh, what's his name down at Anna Point. Uh, I know who you're talking about. Yeah. But his name excuses me, too. Oh, crap. Right now, he's it's going to be coming on the show. Me and I, I should, huh? I said, yeah, I got to get him on the show, too. Like, he, he's yeah. on the list. But anyway, he could talk to you about that. And and that was a very good series and, and had some awesome weights come in. That was he. He could probably I don't know if he has the records, but he he could tell you about some of those 30 pound bags that I don't have the records for. And they were all before the tens in my mm -hmm. my thing, because I. But now some of my 30 pound bags also wasn't five fish. I mean, there was a time when I I had I convinced Arnold when he was running it to change it to seven. OK. And he wouldn't go to five. And uh, so it was seven fish for a while. And I, I have a seven. I have the records on my wall where I caught a seven bag limit. They weighed almost 30 pounds. It was like 29 pounds. And nothing was really that big in there. There wasn't a big seven pounder in there. They were all just nice fish. I, I, I can't you know? imagine catching a nine on the river. Like I would have a heart attack if I stuck something like that in the mat. Like, I mean, it's wonderful, but like, good Lord. Yeah. Well, back in the day, uh, Campbell's Bait and Tackle, which used to be located in Woodbridge, he weighed in multiple nine pounders in one year, and most of them came from Arkendale Flats. That's where that's they a were blast from the past them. too, man. Yeah, uh. that's where they were catching them in Arkendale, and it just was—I mean, it was those. I know many people who caught big fish that came out of there. It, do you? The other thing that you hear from a lot of people that um, aren't from here. Um, is that it feels like our fish are just short and stubby compared. They're, they're fat, they're thick, they're healthy, but they're not these longer ones that you see. Is that something that you could speak to at all? It's been like that. You know, I, I've seen some big fish uh, over my career. You know, I mean, I remember one of my one of my partners, uh, we were fishing in Greenway and, you know, I had just put like a six pounder in the boat and he caught a five pounder. It was probably five inches longer than my six pounder. I mean, it was probably one of the longest fish I'd ever seen in the river. I mean, just looking at it, it was it, it was like gigantic. It was like 26 inches long. And I'm going like, whoa, wow. that's a huge, that was a big length fish. But most of our fish are the the shorter, stubbier, fatter. Uh, you know, I've had fish that were so fat that you couldn't measure them because their, their tail would pull short because they had such a big sides on them. They, you know, when you try to lay them down, they wouldn't meet that, that 12 or 13 or 15 inch line, whichever it happened to be. And it's just because they were so fat and you had to throw him back, you know, and keep us, keep a, a fish that only weighed a pound because he was longer. I wonder why that is. That is so interesting. When I have Joe love on the show, I'm gonna have to ask him that too, to see what he thinks. Yeah, I, they've been like that for, I mean, I have I have fished all over the state of Virginia. I mean, I've every big body of water, every river. I mean, I've been in all of them fishing tournaments. And, you know, that seems to be generally the same. You know, you can go down to Kerr Reservoir. Those fish aren't great big long fish. I mean, it's just they seem to be in the same general category. I mean, you don't see these, you know, great big length fish on, anywhere in the state. I don't I don't believe so anyway. It seems like, and then, you know, guys, I could be wrong about this. This is just a wild, just, I'm going to throw a Hail Mary. It seems like where the F1s were really put in, that's where you see some length. Because I saw some fish pulled out of Smith this year, um, watching BFL footage. Those things look like something you'd see in the Bass Masters out of like the Tennessee or Alabama. Yeah, they are bred here though. That's that's a that's a brought in fish. And I would love yeah. to see them put F, you know, put the F1s in the river. I, I think they would do awesome. But oh, could you hey. 
You know, uh, Rob Greich and his crew, they got together and they brought all they they collected money back in the old days and they had them dumped in the James. And there's been some huge fish caught in the James River because of those. I, I mean, I would think that if it wasn't for what Rob did, not only would the DWR have not saw that, oh, this is something we should investigate, maybe do more of. I don't think Bassmaster and a lot of these other organizations, they the James wouldn't be on the map, I guess is what I'm saying. It wouldn't yeah. be on the map the way it is today. Yeah, because so many places are doing it. I mean, it's just it's just an awesome. And they got that new one out now that I don't know what they call it. I saw a thing I was watching a show on about it where these fish are growing over two pounds in a year. And they're, they're this one guy, is, he's stocking them in private lakes right now. He's not really doing it commercially, but... And they're growing, you know, because they were, I think Hank Parker was one of his shows. He was out there with them and he's catching these two and a half pound fish. And he says, how old is that last year? Because he knows by what the, what he's dumped in this lake and they're just growing like crazy. I think he calls them tiger, tiger bass or he, there's a name for them that he called them. But they're, they're super fast growing now, whether that shortens their lifespan or not. I don't know. I mean, we could you wonder if generics is going to hurt the you know the bass population because you've altered it in some way shape or form but i i I think you have and it's and that's something when i had um when i had the guys on from the dwr on my show earlier in february we talked about the alabama bass issue down south of virginia they talked that the problem is that first generation you get the maximum growth you get the cool 10 pounders those genes don't necessarily transfer to the next generation but on the same token, I just feel like it's supplemental stocking. The idea is like you're doing this, like if you're going to invest millions of dollars into put and take trout, you're doing the same thing that kind of in the same vein, you're helping these fisheries by just supplementing some of the weight with the bigger fish. Yeah. That's all you're doing. And, and it's and it's needed. And I think it does. There's got to be some merit to it. And boy, Kerr could use it. Good Lord, Kerr could use it right now. That was insane. Oh, yeah. that no one broke 20 pounds. I didn't think that. Yeah, it's just. I haven't been to Kerr in a long time. I, I gave up just traveling because I, I fish right here. I, I love the Potomac. I don't have to go anywhere. I, I live five minutes from, I'm, I'm sorry, I live five miles from Pohick and five miles from Leesylvania. I'm right in the middle. Well, I would like a story. Like, I like a story from those years at Kerr, if you don't mind. Like, people said it used to have fish in it. Is that true? Like- <laughs> oh, we, well, in, in back in the old days when I fished in the Virginia Bass Federation, Oh, we always went to Gaston and we went to Kerr and they always picked Kerr to go down there in the spring when the water was up in the willow trees. And I mean, you go down there and you would fish the willow trees. And it was if you knew how to have the proper tackle, you know, a good flipping stick and some heavy line, you could flip in there and catch some huge bass. But mm-hmm. then the Potomac River started developing bigger bass and Kerr and Kerr started going down. So that's part of the reason I quit going, but I still hear some weights occasionally from Kerr that are pretty impressive right now. I mean, there, there are still some good fish there, but just not the numbers. I don't know if it's just the lack of breeding or stocking or whatever's going on with that lake. I mean, they raise and lower that thing so much. I mean, you know, I've been down there where I'm fishing in somebody's backyard on their picnic table when it's up 17 feet and you have, that's when we had our tournament, you know, you didn't have any choice. You went down there. That was when the tournament was. I like, I like how you said that though, because I see that on the, uh, the upper bay. Uh, If you compare and contrast the weights with the top three anglers, a lot of people think like, well, the Chesapeake Bay is better because like everyone's always catching like 23, 25 pounds. However, Half the field does not catch a fish. It, they blank yeah. versus yep. the Potomac. The Potomac, honest to God, looks like Lake Champlain where it's like everybody does well, generally speaking, all the way down in the field. It's way healthier. I'm, I'm, I've am i had mixed results this year. My, my last tournament uh, I just had back in uh, the 10th of June um, was probably I had I had 100 and I had 90. I think it was 99 or 98 boats. And I had 30 boats that didn't catch a fish or they didn't weigh a fish. I mean, some of that can be they got two fish, three fish, and they know they're not going to be in it. They're not worried about the season standing. So they just they dump them, you know. Yeah. But they didn't have a bag, you know. So uh, in the tournament before that, we had 100 and 
three boats, I think it was, and 80 of them all weighed fish. So, I mean, you know, a little, yeah. little different, but a lot of weights, you know, a lot of good weights in that tournament. Sometimes it's just a matter of the weather, what the fish are doing, especially this time of year. And we just had another spawn. We've had two spawns this year. And, you know, my, my tournament the last time, they had just spawned. I caught fish just before that that had bloody tails. So they they spawned just about that week. So yeah, and I I um I had a show earlier where I broke down the the BFL stats for the last six years, the Chesapeake compared to the Potomac, and you can tell like very at at a glance like there's more fish being caught out of the Potomac, no question. And it really shows you that I don't know if it's like there's better habitat here or if there's more yeah. fish or both, but there's also. I think there's been two major fish kills actually on the upper bay too. One when Aaron Martin won back whenever that year was. I think there was another one too. But yeah, yeah, it's just interesting how you got three tidal bodies of water with the James, the Potomac, and then the upper bay. And and they're all three are completely different. Well, you know, I have I have the numbers for my my tournament totals for the top team of the year. Now this is for 10 tournaments. And I can run them down if you want. Yeah, you yeah. You can look at Absolutely. how it's changed over the years. This starts in 2010, 106. 11 was 103. 12 was 115. 13 was 120. 14 was 129. 15 was 117. Uh, 16 was 152. Now, I, I, I have no idea... I, I try to remember why there was such a big gap on those two years. I mean, it, it was probably just whatever was going on in the river. Uh, and, and 17 was 160, 18 was 168, 19 was 143, uh, 20 was COVID gear. So that was only 78. I only had five tournaments. 21 was 128, 22 was 121. And 28 wasn't the best of years. I mean, we had... We, a lot of a lot of bags came in where people were winning money with 15, 16, 17 pounds was top money in a couple of tournaments. It's just for whatever reason, last year, the, the bass numbers were off. I mean, the and weights were off, not the numbers. I mean, still catching five fish, still weighing a lot of fish, but the weights were down. And I'm curious by that, like how much that has to do with. I'm just looking at 20 and 21. What COVID did yeah. to the river? Well, twenty was COVID. Yeah, yeah, and that's what I'm saying. Like, what did that you think did to the river? Did it just give it? It didn't a do anything. I only had five tournaments, so double yeah. that weight. I mean, it wouldn't let me have tournaments. They they weren't mm -hmm. allowing us to get together in a group. Yeah, so yeah. There was yeah. No I, I just meant in general because there was no tournaments the next year. Do you think that helped hurt or was indifferent to the river? I, I don't think it. I mean, if you look at the numbers, they're they're actually less than they were for the two or three years before that. So um, I think it goes through phases. I mean, I've been watched, I've been fishing a river for so long. I've seen years where it was like, my God, you know, if you don't have five fish for 25 pounds, you're not even going to cash a check, mm -hmm. you know? And then a couple of years later, if, if you had 25 pounds, you're winning the tournament and it goes up and down. I mean, I, I, I'm not sure why I, I'm not a biologist and, you know, I, I see the river. Sometimes I look at it and I say, well, it's been muddy for three weeks, you know, so whatever that does to the fish or the grass or the bait or, you know, how many, how many crawdads we find on our live well, whether you find a bunch or none, you know, what kind of bait are they eating? I mean, I'm everything's all combined. I mean, mother nature does that to us, you know, it's just. In years, you have fish throwing up huge bait fish in your live well. In other years, you don't even see any. And, you know, so what's happening to them? Or are they not eating them or are they not here? Yeah, that is interesting. I mean, everything does it definitely goes into cycles. I mean, it's even like the types of bait we throw from the chatter bait to these, you know, $2,000 glide baits that some people throw. Like everything is, is a cycle. Yeah. With the, um, the Tackle Warehouse Invitational that came here, what did you think about the weights? Did you feel like that was what you expected? Was that too high, too low? What were your thoughts? I thought generally they were they were good. I mean, you know, compared to my last tournament, you know, I mean, it just uh, my last tournament, I had you know one one good solid bag that was you know up there, and that's what they had. You know, the guy had nineteen pounds, uh, you know, but only one or two. 
You know, you that's just somebody getting lucky. I mean, you know, I mean, skills there because you had to catch the fish, but sometimes it's just a matter that fish bit your lure too. You know, there's there's not like he sat there sight fishing and took it off a bed somewhere. They were just casting and retrieving and, and they caught a, you know, two, four and a half pounders or maybe a five in there. And they got a, suddenly they got a 19 pound bag. You can look at the final day. They had a 20, a 19, an 18, a 16 and two 15s. And that was it. Nobody else had a bag over 15 pounds. And that was out of 50 boats. So that just goes to show you, even the best guys, there's times when they, they can't find the good fish too. Mm -hmm. And it just, what the weather did something. You saw the weights go down in three days. They were better weights on the first day than they were on the second day than they were on the third. And I was out Tuesday and the fish weren't biting. I can tell you, I was out there fishing. What, what do you they think the really best? Down. What do you think the best, if you could do it, if you could pick for a tournament series to come here to show the river off in all of its glory, what would the best time of year be? Two times, spring, early spring. I mean, my best weights show that. I mean, you know, when you're talking, I got multiple bags in the 20 pound range, you know, come in. You know, I had, I had, I had one, the, one of the first, I don't know if it was the first or second one. I, I'm, I haven't, I didn't record the weights on the sheet I have sitting yeah. here in front of me, but it was like three boats had 19 pounds that didn't get a check out of 16 places I paid. So, mm -hmm. I mean, that just shows you, you had all those. 16 boats that had above 19 it was 1966 that didn't even cash a check so i mean that's an awesome bag of fish for a one-day tournament and you got nothing you went home you know because everybody else above you had more weight than that and it was tight i mean it was it was separated by ounces you know in places so and that's a good time and then the other time is probably late august september october okay the weights go back up. I mean, I had 20, I had 20 pounds in the first day of my classic last year in September. That's crazy. Yeah. But I had a six and a half in there too. So that, that makes a big difference. But you know, what, when you catch a big fish. What is the biggest bag you can ever remember on the series that you've had? Just to reiterate that again. Well, 40, over For five, 40 pounds. Five fish limit. That was, that was eight. I had a 40 pound bag. And that was back when Arnold ran it. A 40 and pound, five fish bag. No, that was for eight, seven fish. I'm sorry. Okay. Just making sure. Okay. I was like, holy God. <laughs> yeah. um, but I've seen, um, I remember some 30 pound bags in the, it was during the time of the LAPR circuit that people were weighing five fish for 30 pounds consistently. I mean, that was, that was not just one here, one there. There was a couple of times where there was multiple 30 pound bags weighed and Dave Fontroy, I remembered his name, run, ran that circuit and he, he works down at Lake Anna Marina. So he Damn. runs the tackle store down there. Huge shout out, Dave. I'm going to get you on the yeah. show eventually, but anyway, you're... but anyway, Dave, Dave's a good guy and he, he did, he had a, he had a great circuit going and he had some big weights, but it was only for a couple of years, you know, and then it went away. It wasn't like it was every year. Well, I love giving this question to people. Yeah. Do you think a dirty 30 will be caught again in our lifetime? I think so. It just takes a couple of good years of great spawns. I mean, I, I look at it last year when I was concerned about the weights because I had the weights were down. To me, they were down generally. You know, all the way across the board, it wasn't just like, you know, everybody was catching smaller weights and people were complaining. I can't catch any big fish. I can't. But then at the end of the season, all of a sudden I saw numbers of four and five, you know, three, four, five pound fish coming in, you know, not tons of them, but I saw them and I'm going like this, this is showing that they're there. You know, we just weren't catching them and it came back, you know, and it was just one of those things. Why? I don't know. I, I, I wish I knew because that, that would make me a better fisherman because I could figure out what they're doing. I, I've always wondered if it has to do with like, I don't know because I'm not on the river as much as you, but is it is it the amount of cover? So I'm assuming if you have years with a ton of grass, it would be harder to catch all the fish compared to if you have a massive grass die off and there's less cover. Could that possibly be something? I'm just the opposite with that. When you have tons oh, really? of grass, you know where they're at. 
and you can go fish them. When there's no grass, you don't know where they're at. I mean, okay. are they? Uh, I, am, I've, I've always wondered is where all those fish that uh, give you a good example. I fished north. I love to go up around Bellhaven and fish all the barges and the wrecks and the rock piles that we we spent ages finding with the lack of anything more than a flasher. You know, we we didn't have great depth finders back in there like now with forward facing where you can go out there and see everything you're looking at. That's impressive. But, I mean, we found all these places and a lot of it was like uh I'd go out and watch the pros fish when they were here and I'd see a guy sitting on a spot and I'd go over there and not get close to him, but I'd, I'd get one side and down the other and I'd line up. Well, there's the Wilson bridge and that's pillar number six. And uh, look over there and there's that white house. And I'd write it down on a piece of paper and I'd go back and find it and turned out to be a great rock pile. You know, just that I, I still fish that. And of course now I have them all on GPS, but anyway, but uh, when the grass came in up there, all those pieces of structure died and they're still not back. Hmm. I mean, there, there's places up there. There's a barge out in the middle out there that has five feet of water on one side and 11 feet on the other. And it's full of wood. It's got rocks around it. It's got, you know, the old barge rocks that are all around it. It's a great piece of structure. And I've been up there multiple times and hardly catch a fish on it. Because I think that they all left and went to the grass beds because that there was a time when you had to fish grass, forget structure. They weren't in structure. You didn't find them in that kind of stuff. They were in the grass beds and then the grass beds slowly disappeared and the fish haven't gone back and found those structures anymore. I, I just, they're not there like they used to be. I mean, it, the ones you, it, could go up there, you could catch 25 fish out of that one spot. That's insane. I mean, there's just so many fish there and, and you just, you just called and called and called and called until you got the big bag. Hogs Island was the same way. You could go up here and sit there all day long and catch fish all day long. And over the course of time, you might have four fish in your bag that weighed three and a half pounds. And you'd be in the money. Is it a misnomer with, with vegetation lakes? Let's say uh, the Potomac River is an example that all the fish are shallow. Like, I feel like we always, in our heads as anglers, don't think these fish go very deep. Or, or what is deep for a Potomac River bass? Well, considering that other than a couple of spots on the river, the, most of the river, the deepest parts of it is 30 feet, like 32 feet deep. There are several spots. Fort Washington Lighthouse is 60 some feet deep. Buoy 56 is in the 50s. And that's the only two places south of the Wilson Bridge that are that deep. You know, most of it's, the river is generally 10 feet or less other than the channels. I mean, you, you have so much shallow water in the river, but I have two places on the river where I caught literally dozens of fish that we were fishing in 20 feet of water, but it was on a barge but that was down on the bottom. If you and were, ask. They, and and we, had to, we had to learn how to bleed them because they would get belly, you know, the, the air bladder would blow up on them and they'd float. And, you know, we learned how to, to stick a needle in them and bleed the air out of them. And then later I found out an easier way was they, they made clips with weights on them and I put two clips on their belly fins and it would hold them on the bottom of the tank and they'd, they'd survive it. I still have them. They're still in my boat. Oh, that is so cool. I, but, but I mean, that was, you know, you catch a fish out of 20 feet of water, it gets the bends. If you asked a regular bass fisherman what the average, like what depth could you catch a bass in on the Potomac? I don't think any of them would guess for a thousand dollars, 20 feet. Like it's, it's so weird how that gets in our brain. Well, we fished the Wilson Bridge and some of the pylons we fished were in 20 feet of water. And there was, there was fish on them. I mean, I, I have one little spot up there on the Virginia side. One side of the, there's two pilings. The one on the left going north was sitting in 18 feet of water. And the one on the right was in seven feet of water. And my old partner and I, Dave, we were just up there fishing for fun. And we sat there for five hours and caught over 100 bass. And most of them came out of the deeper water. That's insane. Have And it never happened again. But I mean, that one day they were all there. And, you know, we fished the, the city of Alexandria, John Robinson's dock. Pilings that sit in 20 feet of water. You catch them on the bottom. Hmm. Not many have fished there. 
um, you know, they're there. They they'll go uh, Mallows Bay. There's places out in front of it where it's you know it's 15 feet of water out there. Smoots Bay. I mean, even Smoots Bay or, or the spoils. There's deep water in both of those places, and, and fish get in them, and they stay there. They fish there all the time. The spoils has 20 some feet of water in it. I need a story. You gotta give me a story. What kind of story? <laughs> oh my goodness! What's the first story that pops to your head? I I got way too many stories. I don't know. Uh, I, how about this? What trophy means the most to you? What stories with that? Probably um, pro am teams. That was an organization that ran out of Chester Ice House in Richmond, and they had a big circuit that mostly stayed down there, but then they started coming up here. And I have five first place plaques on my wall from winning Pro-Am teams. And they were, at, back in those days, they, those were 80, 90 boat tournaments. They were big tournaments, a lot of big guys. Matter of fact, Vaughn, who was just in the uh, uh, Major League Fishing, was one of the old Pro-Am team guys. And I, I met him in fishing Pro-Am teams. Dr. Greg South. Wow. Um, what's his name? Um, his, uh, why can't he's a pro? He's from down there. He fished Pro-Am teams. I fished against them. And now they both went pro. But I, I have five, five of their wins. And three of them were in one year. So What was, what was the winning bait back then? Worms or jigs. That's all we threw. I never, I hardly ever threw crankbaits. Maybe rattle traps in the spring, but we fished pig and jig. I, I threw a, I, back then I used to, we, we went from a Stanley half ounce jig to, I, I, one day I found some triple rattle back. Ooh. And I still have them hanging on the wall. Anyway, uh, started throwing those and the fish liked that rattle. And we started using those and that probably put more fish in any boat for years. I mean, that's what we jigged in the water. We, I mean, you didn't have, we didn't have tube claws. You didn't have reaction innovation, sweet beavers. I mean, none of that stuff was made. I mean, it was nothing like that. You had plastic worms, you know, you had grubs, you know, and that's what you fished. I mean, a grub was basically the swim bait before the swim bait, especially for, you know, my smallmouth guys. Well, there, I've caught a few smallmouth. I got a one that's, I got a picture of one that looks like there's something wrong with him because he's so short, but he weighed three, over three pounds. And I caught it underneath a dock in, in Broad Creek many, many years ago. And I was flipping. We were fit, fishing a tournament for bass. Oh, that's And fun. I flipped up underneath there and that fish hit it. He jumped up twice and hit the bottom of the dock. And I'm, I'm, Dave says, what do you got? And I said, I don't know, <laughs> you know, finally got it out. And it's this little short, fat, small mouth. Oh, that's and a... we, we've caught some small mouth down river. I, the farthest down river I've ever caught one is down around Bowie 56, which is just south of Pohick. I've caught a few in that area, but I've heard other people say they've caught them down near Mattelman. So the small mouth are around. They're just not numbers. Yeah, I've, I've heard rumors and, and legends of catching big ones up in D.C. before, So, but never, there used never to be verified. A, there, there used to be a lot up there. Uh, I had some buddies that fished the Anacostia, and they, they, it was not unusual for them to come in with a two-and-a-half, three-pound smallmouth in their bag. I went up there years ago with a couple of friends, and we'd go up there and putt around the big rocks that were up there above the bridges and catch, catch nice smallies back then. You know, we, we were afraid to go up there because we didn't know the river. You know, mm -hmm. we didn't have all the electronics. You got that you'd bump into half of them because you didn't, you know, your flasher wouldn't see it until after you hit it. So how do you read a flasher? That looks like it would give me epilepsy if I stared at it. Yeah, you had to. I mean, that's what you had. That's all it was. I think my first bath boat had two flashers, one in, one in the dash and one on the front. Whew. And that was it. That was my tracker. I didn't know there was no such thing as a an LED screen. What, what what's that? Oh, that was something new, you know. <laughs> but go from now I got four so I got forward facing on there. So you can and that that's a great thing. It really it really helps me. 
not so much see the fish on the river, but I'm looking at this, the, what I'm looking at, the grass clumps and the log laying there. And you can see the fish. I mean, I've, I've seen fish. I've watched them come out of the grass, come up and look. I've watched them follow my bait. It's amazing how many fish are in the river that you see follow your bait on forward facing and they never touch it. It really makes me realize how terrible of a fisherman I am when you have that on your boat and you can look around. I was like, son of a bitch, they're actually, they are here. They just don't want to, they don't want what I have. Yeah. That was the first thing I found when I, I bought it and I bought it last year. I got a Garmin unit uh, and I like it. And I got buddies that have the, the newest Lowrance is awesome. The, the Lowrance forward facing two or whatever they call it. Mm -hmm. That, that is, that's impressive. That, that is sweet. It really, it really sings compared to the first one. Uh, but it's, it's amazing just to see how many fish you can see. And, and I, I learned from a couple of guys that I know really well. And, and one of them fishes the fountainhead all the time. And he's a, you might have a, had Matt on your show. I don't know if you've had him on or not, but yeah, huge shout out, Matt. Well, yeah. He taught me and, and he said, look, when you pull up to one of these docks and you see all these fish here you make two casts out of them, if they don't bite your lure, leave. <laughs> And I, you know, that's kind of hard for me to say, leave fish. What, what are you talking about? Leave fish? He goes, they're not biting. He said, you're going to know right away. If they're there and they're hungry, they're going to bite now. And that, it, that's kind of different. So that blew my mind, though, about using it is appreciating the fact that if they're going to eat, they're going to eat. And, and yeah. it made me think about before live scope. How many times was it on the 30th cast did I actually catch one? Uh, it wasn't so much the 30th cast. I think it probably was. You just got near a fish or, or that. Yeah. New or, and you know, because I mean, it's, it's amazing to me sometimes. And it happened to me in my last tournament. Uh, I was fishing in Quantico. I probably had five fish that hit the bait when it hit the water. I mean, and I'm throwing a chatterbait. I mean, you know, it's going down, going splash, bang. I mean, it, they hit it right then instantly. And are they sitting there looking at it coming down or they chase it? I don't know. I mean, it's, you know, and then other times you, you can't get them to bite if you threw a, a live minnow out there, you know, you could put a shiner out there and they wouldn't eat it. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that just depends on what they're doing. But uh, I enjoy the live scope. It's, it's pretty, my, my forward facing, my, I like it. It does what I want it to do. And that's see the grass clumps. That's all I really look for. Bob. I really appreciate you coming on and just sharing your knowledge and your history with, with the river. And, and I want to say thank you just for all the work that you've done with Potomac teams doing this. Cause again, I'll reiterate it again, you know, this is not your retirement fund, you know, oh, you're no. not getting the mansion with this. This thing. cost me money. Well, I, I probably spend, yeah. spend some of my money running this thing. You know, I don't charge them anything for my website. You know, I don't, I don't, that's just something I have and I have to pay for it. I don't care. It's just part of my little bit of pittance I get out of it. Like I said, when I pay out, you know, the entry fee that I use is it's one hundred and twenty dollars. The 20 goes to expenses and in the end season finale. Hmm. And my expenses are minimal other than the polygraph. The polygraph's a bit expensive. That's probably my biggest expense in running Potomac games. Um, but then out of the hundred, 10 is for big fish. And out of the 90, I pay back 89 percent. So. I mean, and that's that's where it all goes. I mean, and I, I I pay the bottom guy gets his money back. I don't I don't give anybody any little twenty dollar check. You know, if you come in the bottom money, you got one hundred twenty bucks. You didn't get any gas money, but you got your entry back. I appreciate that because sometimes with the uh, MLF BFL thing, it's like, okay, what the heck am I going to do with six dollars? <laughs> like yeah, I mean that <laughs> used to be the way in the region when I fished the old Bass Virginia Federation. You you'd get you'd go out there and you'd fish a tournament. And we had some huge tournaments because we got so big, nobody could hold us. Region one had over 400 people in it at one time. And nobody wanted to let us have a tournament there because we were way too big. And, but you'd get a check for $18. You know, I mean, your entry fee was 25 or 20. I think it was 25 when I first started fishing that. But anyway, stay 25 forever. I think you're still only 35, but because they don't want to spend any more money. But, you know, it's just, uh, you know, I, I don't believe that. I said, the guy should get his money back, you know, at least if I'm going to give you, if you, and I pay back in cash, so there's no checks. You know, I, I do it all in cash. But 
you know, huge shout out to you. And then um, just to make sure, as always, guys, link in the episode description to everything that we talked about today, including to a Potomac Team's website. Uh, there are a couple tournaments left on the year that you can enter. Um, I think you said you have a makeup one in like well, in a couple days from yeah. now. It's 24. And then you have one in July and then you have one in August, correct? And September. And September. Now, and then, and, and, and then the classic you wouldn't be eligible for at this point if you haven't fished because you have to fish five tournaments. Gotcha. Anybody who fishes five tournaments can fish the classic because that's where I give back the, the big money. I, I mean, I'm paying back, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of anywhere between five and eight thousand dollars additional to the entry fee. Whew. And that's where that twenty dollars goes. So, so it, it, it's a big payout at the end of the year. If people wanted to join this, they're listening right now. They're like, I really want to join this. Is this something that they can still join this year? How do they sign up if, if they want to? You show up at the tournament site. Boom. You you can you can pre-register, but you wouldn't be able to pre-register for this Saturday because you, I, I prefer to get checks two weeks in advance so I can, you know, get them on my bank and get the cash out because I, I do pay out all cash. And so I somebody sends me a check at the last minute, then that means I got to dig in my pocket to come up with the, you know, the entry fee. But, you know, um, if you want to prepay for like July or August, you can send me a check. You can go to PotomacTeams.com. My address and everything's on there. Send me a check for 120 bucks and you'll be in for the next one in July or August or September. Uh, if you want to fish all of them you or next year, you would fish a minimum of five tournaments. We'll get you in the Classic, which is the last one. I, you have there's eight open tournaments and then the Classic is two days. It's Saturday, Sunday, and that, you know, that's it. So you got to fish five of the eight. You can fish the classic. And one question I feel like some people might ask is if they don't want to send you a check, can they just show up with cash? Yes, I'm sorry. Uh, I do. A, a lot of people show up the morning of the tournament. Okay. I'm down at the park at 5 a.m. That's when the gates open. I'm usually the first one in the front of the gate. Uh, Cause I get there. I have to get up at three o'clock in the morning and go down there and be the first one at the gate. You're a saint. Uh, but anyway, the um, I'm usually parked in front of the ramp with my boat, silver Ford truck, with my lights on, cable in front of the truck, uh, or anybody needs to fill out a re entry form. I prefer if you just want to show up, just go on the web page, uh, print out the entry form, and pre-fill it out. It saves you a lot of time, you know, because then it's everything's done. You've signed it. You you know all your information's there. Hand it to me. I write a number on it. That's your boat number. The numbers are given out in order. So I'm currently have like 42 boats pre-registered for this coming tournament. So the first guy that shows up at the truck on Saturday will be boat 43 unless somebody gives me some money in the next two days. Hmm. Uh, but, you know, I mean, that's the way it works. So there's a line there. You just stand in line, pay me. And the rest of it's pretty simple. I'll, I'll, anybody who hasn't fished a tournament with me, I'll give them, I give them an instruction sheet. I give everybody a little instruction sheet on the, the ins and outs, the basics, you know, how the weigh-in's done, check in, check out type of stuff so good deal again guys link in the episode description of everything we talked about today bob i can't thank you enough for coming on this show i really appreciate it uh everyone just please like and subscribe to the channel it really helps me out if you if you don't want to watch on youtube don't worry we are ranked nationally uh on apple podcast spotify and iheart radio uh we are the fastest growing fishing show in the dmv metropolitan area we'll see you next time on fishing the dmv bye you're listening to fishing the dmv with your host thomas aarons and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.